Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by my all new Super Learner Academy, the home not only of the all new Become a Super Learner 2.0, but also of my exclusive master classes and audiobooks, digital books, and tons of exclusive content only available to members of my master classes or my master class bundle, where you can purchase multiple courses and save a ton on getting all of that great content. So to check it out and to see all this amazing new content that we've recorded exclusively for Super Learner Academy, visit Become a superlearner.com and use the coupon code podcast to save. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome to the show. So as some of you guys may know, if you follow me on social media or if you've been reading the Becoming a Superhuman blog, I've been experimenting with a pretty interesting and pretty strange new phenomenon or therapy, and that's called transcranial bright light therapy. Now, for those of you in the audience who know a little bit of Latin or are med students, you will know that transcranial means through the skull, as in into the brain. So basically, there is no delicate way of putting this. I've been shining bright white light on my brain to try and alter my circadian rhythms and moods. Now, since receiving a sample unit in the mail a few months ago, I've honestly been completely blown away by how effectively this stuff actually works. I should honestly say I've been blown away that it actually works at all. And so today, I've invited the chairman of the board of Valky. Now, they're makers of the human charger, and throughout this episode, we're going to try and figure out exactly how this thing works and why it works. But beyond just Valky, I found out during my research that my guest is not only a serial entrepreneur himself, but really an overall superhuman. He sits on the boards of tons of incredible companies doing tons of innovative and surprising things from AI-powered robots to medical technology and waste management. He's even on the board of the company that does the popular video games like Clash of Clans. All in all, he, through his VC firm, is working with over 20 different companies. So really an absolute superhuman. And in the episode, we tried to touch on that as well. So we spend the first 10 or 12 minutes talking about how he balances and manages his life, how he manages to be so productive, how he manages to set priorities and goals. And then we dive into the human charger and his journey with that company, how the human charger works, what the research says about transcranial bright light therapy. In total, you're going to learn a lot in this episode. You're going to take away some actionable items that will make you more productive, and it might just pique your curiosity if you're someone who suffers from low energy, suffers from jet lag, or maybe gets seasonal affective disorder. This episode might really impact the quality of your life positively. And so without any further ado, I would like to get into the episode with Mr. Timo Ahopelto. Mr. Timo, welcome to the show today. We are so excited to have you. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me. I understand you're a very, very busy man. I went into researching for the podcast thinking, you know, that your full-time gig was actually at Valky, but it turns out you have a very, very, very full plate. And actually, it was quite difficult to come up with a bio for your introduction. So I'm going to try here and list I'm not even actually going to try to list. You sit on the board of so many companies and you're involved in so many industries. So I guess if you could, let's start out maybe by tracing your path and how it brought you to where you are today. I'm kind of an entrepreneur who has turned early stage investor. So that's the kind of the best way to describe it. But mm. you're totally right, Jonathan. I mean, I have a lot of kind of uh, balls in the air and, and there's a lot of industries. I mean, I'm currently working everything from medical technology into, you know, hardcore biotechs trying to cure cancer into mobile apps like for casual health for people to get better. 
into wind power for large cargo vessels. So there's a lot of like stuff, mobile games, obviously, because Finland is the country of mobile games. Right. So we were among the first ones to work with Supercell, which obviously a lot of people know Clash of Clans and Heyday and, and, and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, so I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I have never been working for anybody else almost or, or only a very short period of time in my life. And uh, I've always wanted to kind of do my own thing. So, <laughs> so to be only responsible of my own future by myself. And uh, that led to... The first more serious company that I had was capturing clinical trial data from patients in clinical trials globally. And then that's where I got my kind of a hardcore crash course introduction to healthcare mm-hmm. and medical field and, and, and all that. And then since, you know, I left that company, I wanted to do something else. I went to the new media and we built an operator that was targeting young people with advertising fund with model in the UK, Netherlands and, and in India. And, and that was the kind of a, a really exciting experience to do something. I mean, coming from pharmaceuticals into new media is kind of uh, two yeah. ends of the spectrum, I guess. And, and this has been driving me throughout the whole of my life in a way that I, I've always wanted to go into the next thing and then I always wanted to learn something new and and I'm always kind of going after something <laughs> yeah <laughs> to learn to keep on learning and I guess that the common nominator in all of these things is in a way that if you look at the companies we have invested and look at the companies who we work with right now is that they all have a what I call like complete product so it means that what the company is delivering is a solution to a specific problem or to a specific challenge. So it's not the component, but it's a specific solution. And and that is something that I feel that I get my head around relatively well, is that there's a company X in an industry Y, and then these are the reasons why they would be able to change, you know, even a little bit of that, you know, the way the status quo on, on a specific area. And then those type of companies we go after and we enjoy working with it. And Human Charger is, is one of them. Right. So I do want to get into that. But first, you know, I have some kind of tangential questions just around how the heck you manage your time. How do you manage to fit in so much in one day? Yeah, a lot of people are asking that. And I've been thinking about it myself as well. I try to focus on one thing at the time very intensively and then forget everything else. Mm. And a lot of people are worrying about the everything else that you're not focusing on. And that takes your you know, brain power, I guess, or emotional energy or however you want to describe it. So if I'm currently working with roughly like 20 companies and a lot of people are thinking that, hey, that's quite a lot. But I mean, I'm working one at a time, in a sense. Obviously, this is like oversimplification, but I'm kind of working sure. with one at a time and very intensively and putting all energy into that. And then those priorities may change, you know, during a day. So you have one company you work with for three hours, and then you have another company you work with for four hours, and then moving forward. But the key trick that I'm using is not to worry about everything, anything else. Even if there's like big fires out there, and even if there's a crisis, that's the, the one strategy. And then the second strategy is that I've been trying to figure out that what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, which is almost like a jargony thing that a lot of people are saying that everybody Mm -hmm. needs to figure out what they're good at and what they are not. But it's really essential because then you should be only doing the things you are good at with those companies you are involved in and not to be involved at all in the things that you are not good at. And an example is like if there's a company that is developing novel technology, but you don't really know enough about it to be able to contribute to the R&D plan, I mean, you should not spend any time on that because the only thing you are doing is you are constraining other people's resources while trying to get you educated about it. So that's the second strategy. I think that's such a powerful life lesson, not just in, in managing companies or in investing, but really in life. I mean, so right now I'm in the process of hiring a new team member to do all the things that I've been trying to do, but I'm just not very good at. And I think knowing what you're not good at is perhaps more important than knowing what you're good at because you know to reach out for help or to pass on opportunities. Yeah, that's right. 
like I said, it's almost like a jargony thing. I mean, if you read books and if you read these blogs about the characteristics of the, you know, best performing X, Y, Z people, I mean, internet is full of those things. Usually you see the thing that, you know, you need to know what you are good at and especially what you are not good at. Right. But it's really difficult to get to that point. I mean, to figure out that what I'm not good at, because typically, and especially as an investor, like what is my current role is you are not getting that feedback too often because the entrepreneurs are kind of thinking that, hey, this guy put some money into our company. So <laughs> we need to give him a voice in everything that he or she wants to have. Sure. And it's a very problematic. I mean, not all entrepreneurs are giving f- feedback and are kind of operating in a way that, you know, hey, Timo, you don't know anything about this. Sure. So, <laughs> so it's better that you do something else. Yeah. Yeah. In my own investments, I've noticed the same thing that when the company gets to a certain phase where now they're focused not as much on marketing, but on, say, hardcore product development yeah. or something that you're not good at, you'll just stop getting emails. And then when you kind of poke your nose in and you're like, hey, besides, you know, the quarterly report, I don't hear from you guys. They're like, oh, yeah, everything's going well. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's clearly yeah. like, keep your nose out of it, please. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Interesting. Let me ask this question, though. How do you set those goals and priorities? You said that you work on one thing at a time, but how do you prioritize what is going to be the one thing that you're working on that day or that week or that afternoon? Yeah. So in my current kind of a daytime job, if you call, like I'm working with these multiple companies and, and I always say to people that I, I'm available. So my calendar is really flexible. I mean, if you would be an entrepreneur and calling me that, hey, we need to talk about this. I mean, I probably have free time like tomorrow morning that we can chat for an hour or for an hour and a half. So I have a very little amount of pre-booked meetings. If you look at my calendar after two weeks, I mean, there's only some board meetings and and all that stuff, but very little like a pre-booked activities. So I'm available whenever somebody needs me. And it sounds like a chaotic way to organize your time, (laughs) but it works very well in a way that if I open up right now after this podcast, I open up my email. There's probably emails about five different entrepreneurs. So I just read them through and and I somehow prioritized that, oh, okay, so these are the things from these guys and, that I need to work on right now. And, and then I just, you know, start working on it in the order that I feel that is I good. And, and then there's always some balls that kind of uh, drop to the, it's obvious. I mean, if you have so many things, I mean, there's always some things that you forget, but people typically kind of forget back to you. <laughs> it's, sure. I know that it's, it's really naughty and you should not work that way, but people kind of forget back to you in a way that, hey, Tim, I really need this. So I really need your help in this and, and all that. So it's also depending on the entrepreneurs. And if there are like entrepreneurs listening who have investors or advisors in their companies or in your life uh, in other way. So some people get so much more out of the investors and the advisors or people close to them than other people. And what we have learned, I mean, I've been investing into about 60 companies and the best entrepreneurs and best people, they are really good at utilizing people around them for advice, for small help and keeping them close and, and all that. And that's like a striking difference between the best entrepreneurs and the not so good entrepreneurs. Right. And I think that's a lesson, again, that transcends entrepreneurship because the best authors are the people who reach out to other authors and look for mentors. The best athletes are people who take the most advantage of the coach's time. I mean, anything you're doing in life, if you're the kind of person who's not only going to reach out and earnestly ask people for help, but also build that kind of rapport with people, It's the whole Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. If you get people to want to help you, you're going to be so much more successful in anything that you want to do. Yeah, that's right. And and then it's a factor of like, it's more fun to work with some people than other people. It's more exciting to work. And uh, some people are really skillful in a way how they kind of drag you into what they are doing. And uh, then... I'm not prioritizing in a way that, hey, you know, I have put like 100 units of money into this company and 10 units of money into this company. So this 100 units is more important than these 10 units. Sure, That's not the way how I prioritize. I prioritize by the need of these companies. So Excellent. 
Awesome. So I do want to shift gears a little bit towards yeah. the original intention of the R- the interview, yeah. which was to talk about Human Charger or Valky, yeah. as the company is called. Now, I have to say, I've been enjoying mine. I have a couple of them here that Valky yeah. was really kind enough to send me for testing and to yeah. distribute to other friends of mine and stuff like that. So to start out, tell our audience about the Human Charger, how it works, and how you got involved with them. Yeah. So Human Charger is an iPod size style device with two earplugs but it's not music it's light so you are actually beaming light via ear canal onto your brain 12 minutes a day if you want to get more energy during the winter time Mm -hmm. and we launched the product about five years ago the customer feedback has been extremely positive eight to nine out of ten people are actually recommending this to their friends during the winter time usage and uh, yeah, it, it's really based on a, a new scientific discovery that people in the very north of Finland, where the sun never gets up during the winter, right. made. So they were figuring out there were one uh, scientist and one Nokia engineer who were kind of thinking that, hey, you know, it's too dark here and uh, <laughs> we need to do something. <laughs> and then they had all plans about lighting up the whole of their houses. And, and they were just counting that this is kind of a, going to cost too much to light all the walls and and this can't be true that you need to light the walls because you would need to light yourself right right and and then they started to study and and they came to across some research about circadian rhythms and and how you can change the circadian rhythms of animals with extraocular light so meaning that light projected to somewhere else than to the eyes Wow. And, and then they talk with the world's leading scientists and then everybody was saying that, yeah, it's a well-known phenomenon that you don't need to have eyes to shift circadian rhythm. So you oh. only need to have brains and you only need to have a central nervous system that is sensitive to light. And, and then they started to study more, did first initial clinical trials. They were studying the human brain and actually were able to identify and allocate very precisely certain light-sensitive proteins in the human brain. And then those light-sensitive proteins are the same protein family that we have in our eyes, which is completely natural because, I mean, nature is using the same building blocks very effectively. And if you have, you know, light-sensitive proteins in your eyes, you have light-sensitive proteins on your skin, the same light sensitive proteins are in your brain. That's the way how kind of a Valky got started. They first did an initial trial with 13 people who were extremely, extremely depressed during winter time. So totally not able to function during the winter months. And then out of those people, nine out of 10 got totally cured during uh-huh. that period of few weeks of using this device uh, daily for 12 minutes. So that was obviously a very encouraging result. And and since then, the kind of a trial plan and the science plan has advanced. And then obviously the company launched the product and then has right now been then available for people to try and test wow. and, and get their own feelings. Yeah, I have to admit, you know, I was completely skeptical because, you know, I do use the Philips Hue lights and I am very sensitive to light and I know how important it is to not expose your eyes to blue light. But even when I heard Ben Greenfield talking about the product, I was like, come on, you know, you're shining light (laughs) in my ears. First, I thought, okay, it must work by just shining UV on parts of your body that are not suntan, so they're very yeah. susceptible. But then I read the product packaging and it's like absolutely no UV emitted <laughs> from what I understand. Yeah. I was like, okay, yeah, right. this is a lot of woo-woo. But you know, <laughs> I tried it yeah. at, uh, at Summit at Sea. I should have been seven hours jet lagged and I timed it just right so that I was up until one or two in the morning socializing and I was waking up at seven in the morning, every morning, no jet lag. Yeah, that's right. There's something up to it. And and what was weird for me, the placebo effect is one thing, but I would notice if I was busy, you know, interacting with people, my phone was away from me, I didn't feel the notification, all of a sudden, I would just hit a wall. And then I'd look at my phone and it would say 30 minutes ago, time for human charger. I'm like, Oh, 
oh my, yeah. I basically missed this very regimented schedule that the product builds for you. So I thought that was really, really interesting. I know there was a little bit of controversy in the early days regarding this whole transcranial light therapy thing. Yeah. What has research shown since in the five years that you guys have been active? Yeah, that's by the way, uh, first your reaction is like, uh, I mean, usually when people hear about this, they're like, you know, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what's going on here? So, and a lot of people think that we are like, putting light into the ear. So, I mean, that, you know, what type of cells are there in an ear that are sensitive to light? But it's obviously not the ear, but it's the brain. And the brain is just like totally sensitive to light throughout the whole brain tissue almost. Yeah, you are right. So there was a lot of controversy. I mean, there's always controversy when you are going against the existing scientific uh, (laughs) doctrine in the sense. And, And the light pathway why uh, I is so well established and as there's so many established scientists in the area and, and actually the ones who have founded the whole like bright light research they are still alive and, and they are still like very respected parts of the scientific community as they need to be it just got so much kind of a pushback from that community and, and I'm trying to shoot it down and from multiple angles and from multiple directions that first of all that there cannot be like light sensitive proteins in the brain so there cannot be anything that is sensing light in the brain Uh, well university of Oulu in northern finland uh, they have shown that there's actually several proteins in the human brain that are sensitive to light and uh, since then the american allen brain institute and allen brain atlas which is available online they have made the similar findings a couple of years ago so that's the kind of the first point and then the second point is that there cannot be like any type of efficacy so if you put light into the brain okay if you have this light sensing proteins there it cannot do anything and then we have done a lot of imaging studies where we can show that the kind of a neural networks of the brain get activated after three minutes of light via ear canal in oh, really? the brain and in a placebo control setup in a way that there was a group of people who were lying in this uh, fmri machine with the light guides in their ears, but the light was not projected into there. And then there was another group lying in the same machine, and then the light was projected into their ears. And there was a significant difference between these two groups in wow. the way how the brain activated. And, and then they say that, okay, so you can have functional differences in the brain, but how about the clinical things? So does your jet lag get away and does your seasonal affective disorder or winter blues get away? And, and then there was a lot of critique towards non-randomized, non-placebo controlled trials that we did the first ones, which is very natural in science. I mean, first, when you do the proof of concept trials, you typically do them in an open label setting. So you don't have a placebo group. But for example, during the past two to three years, all the trials that we have done have been placebo controlled trials. And for example, in this jet lag that you were referencing to, right. I think that we just in early last year or in April 2014, we published, I guess, what is the biggest placebo control trial in jet lag using bright light therapy. Mm-hmm. And we had there like 55 people who were traveling from Europe to the US and then back. Part of the people had a placebo device and part of the people had a real human charger. Uh And uh, the the end result was statistically significant. And it was that your jet lag goes away about double speed when you are using human charger. Right. And uh, roughly three times as many people didn't get rid of the jet lag symptoms in the placebo group as they. So there was like a three people not cured compared to every kind of a person who got cured with Valky, so with human charger. Wow. So the results were really good. And, and this is what we realized based on the consumer feedback, like I said. So I think that, I mean, these are like a long shots in a way. I mean, it takes, you are not launching a product that is based on new science in one year. You do it kind of in you know, 10 years. <laughs> so right. we are right now at the year number five. Right. Let me ask this, and I know, you know, you're not a neuroscientist, nor am I, but do you know anything about what's actually happening in the body when those light sensitive proteins are activated? Because, you know, what I think is probably happening 
is maybe similar to what caffeine does, which is blocking adenosine receptors. But I really can't figure out how it's working because you don't get the hangover or crash that you get from caffeine. But if you miss a treatment, you definitely feel withdrawal symptoms like you would if you were addicted to caffeine. I mean, when I was really jet lagged and I missed a treatment, I felt really lousy. Yeah, that's right. I mean, first of all, if I kind of take a one round back, I mean, with many of the medications or many of the treatments that I use today, so the general public thinks that everybody knows how they work. But in reality, I mean, a lot of treatments, no one, no scientist knows what the mode of action really is. Mm. And the same actually goes for the traditional bright light. So there's very little understanding about the different spectral kind of powers of bright light. I mean, this blue light that you were referring to seems to be effective for seasonal affective disorder and shifting circadian rhythms because it kind of affects the melatonin via the eye root. Right. But I mean, the bright light in the sense is not that well understood as people in general think. With regards to human charger, we know that it's not melatonin, so this doesn't affect melatonin. We have a hypothesis and some early evidence on animal models that it could be serotonin and dopamine, which are the kind of a day hormones. So right. melatonin is the night hormone and serotonin and dopamine are the kind of a daytime hormone. So they right. peak at daytime. And uh, obviously what we are currently doing is, is, is we are doing kind of a PET Im- imaging studies to measure the kind of elevated serotonin and dopamine levels in the human brain when you get human charger dosing. Obviously, the brain is probably the most difficult human organ to study for the reason that if you study cancer, you can always cut the tumor out and do your tests, but you just can't cut the brain out. Sure. So it's a very difficult organ to study and, and probably human brain is also the least understood organ in the human body Absolutely. for the same reason. So, I mean, if you really talk about, talk to the birds leading brain researchers and all that, everybody says that we are only scratching the surface right. on how the brain works currently. And there's so much potential in understanding better how brain works in from different angles. But just to kind of cut it short, we believe that it's the hormonal activity. I mean, the brain is controlling the whole of your hormonal activity in the different areas of the brain and and those areas are extremely light sensitive so for example a brain part called uh, rafe nucleus hopefully my pronunciation was correct in english Mm -hmm. is playing a big part in serotonin control and then it's based on one to two centimeters from where the ear canal ends in your brain so it's it's basically right there where the ear canal ends is where one of the core centers of serotonin production is in your brain. So obviously this is a simplification, but just to kind of make the point is that these kind of a deep brain parts are actually very close to ear canal and ear canal is almost like a direct hole in the, those like right. areas. Right. I would definitely be interested in kind of the serotonin reuptake inhibition kind of situation. I'd be super interested to know about adenosine. But as you said, it's pretty hard to measure this stuff unless the way that they're doing it with mice is they're just putting probes into the brain and measuring levels as they go along. I don't think you can do that in humans legally. Yeah, of course not. And and, But what we have done, and if you, and I mean the listeners, if you Google online, you will find some research that University of Oulu has published where we have been doing the mice experiment in a way that there's like mice and then the mice are given light treatment and then these type of levels are measured and and there's a positive uptake on these type of hormonal activities. So, I mean, it sounds like strange, but the mice and rat brain are very close to human brain. So, (laughs) we are relatives. Absolutely. You know, back when I first received the test unit, I messaged Diari and I asked him, what are the other applications? Because it, it actually says right on the box, you know, beat jet lag. But I understand that you guys are using it in Finland for seasonal affective disorder, as yeah. you said. I know Yari uses it every morning to help him get out of bed. What are your thoughts about other potential uses for the device? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound like 
you know, this would be a snake oil to cure everything. Sure. But um, it's like with any medication or any treatment. I mean, if you take like exercise and eating well, right? Uh-huh. I mean, they have a pretty powerful implications across <laughs> multiple disease categories, right? Sure. And on well-being, if you take meditation it has been elevated recently and there starts to be almost like a traditional western clinical evidence about the benefits of certain type of meditation Absolutely. and all that if you take light i mean it's fascinating and a little bit sad at the same time how not so well we understand the meaning of light in our lives and, and i mean if you think about like humans are like daily rhythmicity, annual rhythmicity, and almost like a monthly rhythmicity type of mammals, right? We should be more outside in a bright sunlight than we actually are. Absolutely. You know, daylight. We are in offices, we are in our tubes, we are commuting, you know, we are watching TVs, we are living in the northern latitudes, and then all of that. And no one has actually been... Or there's like a few parties that have elevated to the real importance of like a correct office lightning, you know, the correct lightning in your sure. home, the way how you expose yourself to the daylight and, and all these sort of things. And uh, it's just like now if you then take it back to the human charger, I mean, I know that there are people who are doing shift work who right. are benefiting out of this. And it's the same thing like in jet lag. So you are moving the point when you need to get to sleep with this light exposure and then you are getting better sleep because your body kind of gets the signal or your brain gets the signal that hey you know it's still day daytime and not the nighttime like your body thinks we have been studying ourselves the more severe conditions like acute anxiety uh, for example we have been studying or i know that some people are using this into the some types of kind of a more severe depressions and all that. And now if you think about the mode of action, if it's based on serotonin and dopamine, I mean, they are the really two central hormones in a way how our bodies are functioning. So it means that if we can stimulate that part and if we can affect that part of the human, there's a lot of uses for this type of uh, light treatment. I mean, then the question is that could you achieve exactly the same thing by just being outside in a really bright sunlight for the sure. certain times and, and all that. But obviously in our current lifestyles, it's not always possible. I mean, if you're living here up north, I mean, you just don't have that opportunity during the winter time. Or if you're a business traveler, you don't have that opportunity. If you are a shift worker, you don't have the opportunity of because, mm-hmm. you know, you whole like the day night rhythm is mixed so we are looking at those and the problem from the company's point of view or the challenge is obviously that when there's a lot of things that you could do is that you should always also maintain the focus i mean it's this like Mm -hmm. a business jargon that i find that very funny (laughs) yeah very funny coming from you of all people with 20 companies that you're working yeah that's right keep focused (laughs) right but uh, yeah this is a little i need to tell you a story you know my first company was called CRF Health, Capturing Clinical Trials Data. We started it in 2000. I left the company uh, from the active like duty from 2005. And, and it took me five years to get into that industry, be mm-hmm. accepted in the industry, be respected in the industry. After five years, just before I left, I started to get you know invitations to speak in the conferences and to give my <laughs> advice here and there. And then I left. (laughs) So it took me five years to build this like world's leading competence in this one narrow area. And then I decided to leave. So it's a really funny. I've been always thinking about this, that it would have made things probably so much easier, but not as exciting if I would have just stayed there. And focus. And kind of, uh, yeah, stay focused on that. I kind of enjoy these new challenges. And uh, sure. I guess it's lifelong learning as well. But this is a little bit sidetracked on what we were discussing. Oh, no, that's interesting, though, because yeah. I'm the same way. I teach accelerated learning, but I also produce content on health and fitness and kind of spread myself very thin. But from my experience, there's so much cross bleed. Steve Jobs used to always say that Apple was successful because it was a bleed between design and technology. And I think probably in your companies, you bring health knowledge 
to your AI businesses and to the gaming companies, and you bring AI knowledge to the health and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I guess it's called being able to see things from a different perspective. Sure. But, but obviously, you need to have some touch points to the area that you're talking about because other, or working with, because otherwise, you are just totally lost. Total space cadet. Yeah. And I mean, kind of moving forward with Human Charger, especially right now with the winter time, mm-hmm. we are getting like emails in daily from people who say that, you know, thanks for this. I've tried everything and now this works. I know that this sounds a little bit like cheesy, but... No, it's, I'm using it. I mean, and I'm very, very skeptical on the show of what products I endorse. But I have to admit, if you read my first email back and forth with Yari, I was like, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try it, but don't expect a good review. And in the end, it turned out to be a very good review. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and, and that's by the way, a typical pattern in a way that uh, people are skeptical first. And, and then when they try, I would say that eight or nine out of 10 people are satisfied and, and they get the benefit. Sure. And, and then it gets back to the thing is that like not everybody gets benefit of everything. So there's no 100% sure. treatment that works for everybody or 100% aid right. that treats works for everybody. So. Right. I was listening to a podcast yesterday that actually SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, are the drugs that they're using for. Yeah. They're really depression drugs, but they're using them for PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. And they're only yeah, 60% yeah. effective, which is yeah, crazy. Yeah. And they're estimating that there are as many as, I think, a million soldiers worldwide suffering from PTSD. 60% efficacy is crazy. So if you guys are at 80 to 90, that really says something. Yeah, it is. And and this is actually, it's a funny thing that you mentioned this like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, because it's one of the areas where there has been extensive bright light research with the traditional, like the DARPA funded Mm. clinical trials. And the results have been relatively good. And then I discussed a few years ago with a few of those DARPA guys who are doing these studies, but we never started it. And and this is, again, you know, key focus that we figured out that maybe it's not the first Sure. The segment that we want to start with is, is there. But again, it tells that, you know, the light has these efficacies sure. around the different uses. You know, I'm going to be very, very curious, I have to say, to see the long-term effects once people are using this for, you know, with any new treatment, there is this kind of risk. If people today are starting out with all these new SSRIs, there are risks. And I'm going to be very curious because there are so many people who have downsides from using caffeine. And I wonder, including like, uh, what's it called? Resistance, right? And they get all kinds of like adrenal fatigue from Mm. consuming too much caffeine. So I'm wondering long-term if this can prove to have actually less negative side effects as an afternoon, you know, plug it in 12 minutes because the sun's going down at three o'clock than having a cup of coffee every single day. Yeah. So that's like a really interesting question. I mean, Right now, we have people who have been using, you know, Valky or Human Charge for, this is their fifth year or the fifth winter. Mm-hmm. And, and typically, these people are using it like once a day over a four-month period. I mean, I'm one of those oh, users. Okay. You use it every day. Yeah, I use it every day. So I typically, I do the experiment. I mean, I'm not like a severely depressed during winter time, but... I realized that I'm getting the symptoms. So they are the cravings, like carbohydrate cravings. Uh It's more difficult to sleep well. It's more difficult to get out of the bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow I feel, start feeling that, you know, there's energy loss. Right. And and I typically feel that in the Finnish context where the winter comes very early, I start to feel it in in, uh, November. Mm -hmm. And then when I start using my human charger in like four days, I'm back to normal. So I sleep well, I don't have the cravings and I don't have any difficulty getting out of the bed. Wow. Every year I make the same experiment (laughs) to convince myself that it works. (laughs) I see. So you're not actually using it in summer. I'm not using it in summer. So uh, there's Uh enough sunlight where I'm going during the summertime. I'm using it on a business travel. Oh, yes. (laughs) Yeah, always. Yeah. And then I actually started using it even before we had studied it because I heard from my friends who have been using it, you know, the kind of biohacking themselves in uh-huh. a way that if this is a circadian rhythm 
effect it needs to work for jet lag and they started trying sure. it and then i started trying it and, and then we figured out the kind of a scientific basis how it would work and that's how the trial started and the whole jet lag thing started interesting so there hasn't been any like side effects significant ones that have been had been reported some people are reporting headache when they start using this during winter time and, and then the headache goes away and our hypothesis is that the headache is a factor of that kind of a light impulse getting to these people. Uh, it's the same thing like people have headaches in the spring when the amount of light like suddenly gets up there. So people right. get headaches and, and they get migraines and then they get all sorts of things because there's suddenly more light from the darkness. Right. Absolutely. And I have to admit, I have a little bit of anxiety of traveling because I'm worried that something's going to happen and I'm going to break the cable of the headset or I don't know what, drop it. So I'm thinking about taking two when I go on my trip next month. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. in case, heaven forbid. Yeah. So very cool. I wanted to ask, well, I guess we covered a lot of the things that I did want to ask. One thing I wanted to give our audience was a little piece of homework that they can try or experiment. Uh, and I guess on this, we could shift back to one of your productivity tricks or tips that you use to create some balance and avoid stress. Yeah, this is interesting. So if I think from a personal point of view, during the past three years, I have done a few things, kind of a changes in my life. I mean, mm -hmm. when this amount of companies have increased and all that, in addition to what we have already talked about. And then the first thing is that very simple. I have started to pay more attention to my sleep. Mm. It sounds like really simple and all that, but when you have all these like emails and, you know, people calling and different time zones and, and all that, it is so easy to think in a way that, hey, I do, you know, one more round of emails or one more call or all that. Or I watch a little bit Netflix and all that stuff, but I just put stop on that when I feel that I need more sleep and it pays dividends. I mean, I've realized myself that I feel so much better and I have so much more energy. Right. I have these like three day kind of a rows where I basically say that, hey, now I get to bed like 9.30 or 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. for the three days in a row because I feel that I need to sleep more and it, it just really boosts my energy. The second thing is when you have a busy schedule, it's very difficult to keep on a routine of exercise and that's why I have never went into this like a team exercise or so group exercise type of things. I used to play ice hockey. I mean, everybody in Finland plays ice hockey. It's the <laughs> biggest sport here. <laughs> so I used to play ice hockey when I, until I was 20 years. And, and then I had a pause of many, many years. <laughs> but then three years ago, I decided that, hey, I start doing this because it's such a good exercise, both for the muscles and for cardio. So I, I do two times kind of a one and a half hours of hockey game in a team every week. And, and that is like a really good because it like it, it is something for me that is almost like meditation. I get totally out of the business and totally out of everything else. And then it's a really good exercise. I mean, these are like a really simple things. But if I think about like how I can keep focus in my mind and, and, and how I can be effective when I get to the office and all that, then the third thing is that I have cut out all the unnecessary travel. I mean, I'm extremely uh, selective on my travel. So five years ago, if I was kind of needed somewhere, mm -hmm. it was easy. I hopped to the plane and I flew there and, and all that. But these days, I'm very focused. I mean, I can spend uh, one week on the road with one company if needed. That's no problem. But I select very carefully these type of, you know, day here, day there type of trips because... They are just eating the time that you are effective and can yeah. be kind of doing things. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. So those are the kind of the three things that I've been focusing on. And I mean, I've realized that, you know, all of these things, you know, telephone calls, very effective, in my opinion, you know, the Skype video, very effective, in my opinion, and, and all that for the first things that you are doing. And uh, just kind of avoiding travel, I think, is it's a little bit counter into that i'm in a company that tries to make you travel better and enables you to travel right. more <laughs> with less jet lag but uh, i say that don't travel so much yeah i think there's a difference and i feel the same thing it's the compulsive kind of traveling at the drop of a hat like okay i'll be there as opposed to going on long trips enjoying acclimating to a place and really relaxing 
But yeah, my mission for 2016 is travel half as much as I did in 2015 and and cut out the unnecessary one-day jaunts here and there. Yeah, that's right. It's really funny that you have came to the same conclusion, but I guess you have traveled enough as well to get... I mean, during my CRF Health days, I traveled kind of uh, 150 to 200 days uh, oh, per wow. year. And I mean, if you count the weekends and holidays, you can't travel more than 200 days in a year, roughly. So I was traveling a lot. I mean, it was totally crazy. I got kind of a platinum cards with three different airlines. Oh my God. Sitting in a tourist class. So, you know, you can count the air miles needed for that. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was no, crazy. You're at a different level. Too much for me is traveling 10 weeks a year. Yeah. That's just a different level. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's, you know, if you're running your own company on a dire straits and, and all that, you know the story because you have been part sure. of this. And But it's crazy. So I think that you put it very well. So you said that this kind of, uh, you drop it on top of your head in a way that, well, you know, I'll be there next Wednesday kind mm-hmm. of things. And, and then you don't consider yourself that, first of all, am I really getting out something out of it? Am I really needed there? Is this really critical? Could it be done somehow differently? I think these are like the really critical questions. I mean, if there's one advice for 2016, every time when you are getting a request to be somewhere next Wednesday, I mean, figure out if it's really needed yeah, or if you could be done somehow else. Absolutely. I think that's a great point to end on, Timo. I wanted to ask you if people want to get in touch and learn more about you. I know we'll link people to the Human Charger Hope that they use the link on the blog to make sure that they support this podcast. But if people want to reach out and learn more about what you are doing and what Valky is doing, where should we send them? It's the humancharger.com website. So mm-hmm. just put in human charger and you will find it. Awesome. Either Google or just direct to the URL. Cool. Very cool. And are you on Twitter or something else where people can reach out and tell you if they enjoyed the episode? Yeah, of course. So I'm at Twitter. I'm a Timo MJ, like T I M O M J. Perfect. And yeah, we'll put all the links to all that stuff in the podcast uh, blog post for this episode. Mr. Timo, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. I do hope we keep in touch. It sounds like you are working on a lot of other interesting things that we didn't get to even touch upon today. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It was awesome. nice chat. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. You have a wonderful day and, uh, you know, try and get some sun. Yeah, I will. (laughs) All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. All right, super friends. That's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.